Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Mukund uh, uh, Rangamani uh, from UC Davis, and he's going to be speaking about real-time gravitational replicas. Thank you, Scott. And um, thanks, everyone, for um, coming, and especially the organizers for organizing this workshop, which has been a um, central point of the annual it, um, events uh, in the last couple of years. So indeed, I'll talk today about uh, real-time gravi gravitational replicas. And um, in a moment of somewhat ambitious thinking, I decided to combine a set of topics that I've been thinking about this year into a single talk, and we shall see how that goes. So I, I want to talk about, uh, so most of the year I've been thinking about various real-time effects in gravity. And um, primarily I'll speak about um, a paper that came out last week uh, with um, my friends Ji Dong and Don Narod from Santa Barbara, Don's student, Jen Cheng Wang, and my student, Sean Colin Ellerin, which is to understand the path integral um, in real-time gravity and use it to compute um, replicas. And uh, I'll talk about the first paper that came out last week and I mentioned an example, something else. This will come out sometime later this month, hopefully. And in the second part, time permitting, I want to talk a little bit about how we can use real-time gravity to understand open quantum systems. Um, and this has been working on with um, Logan Eidem and ICTS and various of his students and postdocs. Uh, one of the papers was out earlier this spring. And, uh, but something that I'm very excited about is to think about um, open systems with memory, non-Markovian open systems, which should appear sometime this week. So the broad goal of what I'm after is to better understand real-time gravitational path integrals and um, stationary phase approximation there too. As you can appreciate, this question has relevance um, for a wide set of questions that we find interesting, ranging from computation of entropy-like quantities like uh, swap or ready entropies and uh, just real-time correlation functions. And uh, as, as you will see later, uh, to study of systems uh, which, are, which are open quantum systems. Often, uh, we tend to use Euclidean formalism to compute such observables. And then we can literally continue in some parameter to get the final answer in terms of the real, in the real time domain. And this is widely successful. And I just put in one reference here um, of this famous calculation done by Tardy and Calabresi for computing growth of entanglement following a quantum quench which was done in 2D CFTs using Euclidean methods and the answers compute uh, extended to the physical domain. And from a practical standpoint, this is a very pragmatic strategy because it tells us, as with other non-perturbative effects, it tells us what's hap what happens in the Euclidean domain and we can then use it to inform what the physical answer must be. Uh, and from a gravitational point of view, which is where I'm going, this strategy has been very successful and we've learned lots from the Euclidean quantum gravity path integral in the last five decades or so, uh, ranging from physics of black hole thermodynamics to basically the GKPW dictionary for ADS-CFT. And as we heard in a series of wonderful talks last year uh, on how the black hole information paradox or problem uh, can be um, potentially resolved using the replica wormholes um, uh, by in these papers by the East Coast and West Coast people, and also by the subsequent discussion of baby universes by Marov and Maxwell. From, uh, so in some sense, we know the answer, but at a certain level, it also leaves open the question, what actually is happening in real-time dynamics? So what can we say about that? Um, and for this, I think I, I just want to say a few words about just how one would do real-time dynamics in quantum field theory. And one the thing to keep in mind is when we are trying to do quantum field theory in the real time domain, we have to keep cognizant of the causality constraints. And this usually takes a form of some kind of junior Keldish or in informalism. And I, I'll talk about just this, but the general set of path integrals we'll talk about are, are generally time folded path integrals, which compute Rennie's or uh, compute uh, out of time ordered correlators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we usually do is we want to compute, say, matrix element of a density matrix. Then we start with some initial state, which is some density state, and then evolve forward, and then up to the time of interest, and then evolve back, uh, so that you don't predicate yourself in knowing what happens to the future of where 
you are computing at. And the forward-backward evolutions, and typically we want to glue them on some Cauchy slice. So I have drawn here something that's not usually drawn in quantum mechanical discussions of uh, uh, schwinger kelly path integrals. I've drawn some spatial information as well because this will be important. So here I have two, uh, if you imagine, uh, 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 pieces of path integral, one for the forward evolution, one for the backward evolution, glued together at a moment of time. And this so far is just in quantum field theory, no gravity. And if you want to then talk about reduced density matrix elements, as I will want to do in a second, then you can imagine cutting open this path integral, exposing some region A, and um, using boundary conditions to pick out matrix elements of the reduced density matrix. If you then want to go ahead and compute spectral moments of this reduced density matrix, you just glue together such copies, many copies of this um, functional integral with suitable gluing conditions to compute any entropies, for example, by the replica tree. Okay. So, so this is sort of standard in quantum field theory. And the question is, how do we take this um, and apply it to gravity? At some level, the, the zeroth order dictionary, let's say, if we, so let, us, let us focus in ADS-CFT, the zeroth order dictionary for us is given, to, given already. So we say, you set up whatever problem you want to compute in the field theory, uh, so you have a quantity that you want to compute. You compute it using some stringer Kellish time folded out of time order path integral contour. And what you need to do is allow gravity to fill in this path integral contour and figure out what the saddle points are uh, for the gravitational path integral with a semi-classical uh, approximation and compute in that saddle point. Okay, So that's the rule we've we use in the Euclidean context, we should use the same rule in the, in the Lorentzian context. The question is how do we find such saddles? So the first part of the talk is going to be basically setting up a variational problem for understanding how to do such replica computations in gravity. And um, to do that, let me start by first asking how would one even compute the density matrix in gravity? Um, and I'll, I'll point out here uh, the early works here uh, on trying to understand this problem from the Euclidean standpoint by Lefkowitz and Maldacena, and then followed on by uh, Faulkner, Lefkowitz, and Maldacena, uh, Zhidong, and Dong, and Lefkowitz uh, for quantum extremal surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in the real time contact domain, uh, I think seminal work was done about a decade and some ago by um, Costa Skenderis and uh, Baldwin Reyes, who just employed what I just said of trying to fill in um, gravitational, uh, the boundary conditions coming from the rep, from such replicated uh, time folded contours and try to construct gravity geometry, gravitational geometries. They didn't, they, they sort of mostly were focused on not trying to solve the gravitational equations of motion, which is something we will want to do. In a paper about five years ago with um, Zhidong and Aito Lefkowitz, we used the Skenderis one Reese prescription to try to motivate how the covariant um, holographic entropy proposal comes out of the real-time path integral formalism. And I also highlight, highlight comments in this recent paper by uh, Don and Henry, who said something about observables about, Hawk, about Hawking radiation. So given, so let's just talk for a second about how would one even compute the ket piece of the gravity uh, geometry, uh, gravitational um, uh, geometry for uh, from the given the boundary conditions? So ignore the bottom for a second. So I'm imagining that I've prepared some quantum state. I've evolved it forward, and I have some Cauchy slice on the boundary at some moment of interest. Given that Cauchy slice on the boundary, the bulk Cauchy slice is not uniquely determined. The bulk Cauchy slice can be is floppy and it can lie in anywhere um, uh, within what one might want to call something like a Wheeler David patch of this boundary Cauchy slice. It just needs to be space like um, uh, to, to this boundary Cauchy slice. And so let's pick one of them. And if you're going to talk about Rennie's, we might want to split the boundary Cauchy slice into a region and its complement. And correspondingly, we'll split the bulk Cauchy slice into uh, 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 what one might call a homology region associated with the region 
and another homology surface associated with the complement respectively. And these two surfaces are, uh, ang are uh, joined across some splitting surface gamma, um, which, uh, 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 which is how the bulk is postulated. So, so at this point, we haven't solved any equation of motion, but let's say this is sort of the kinematical ansatz for how the bulk geometry must be constructed. If you want to construct the density matrix element, we would take two copies of this, sorry, just too fast. We would take two copies of this and uh, we would uh, have time running forward in one of them, time running backward in another, the other. And if you actually want to compute the matrix elements of the density, reduced density operator, then we would slice open across the, the entangling surface, which imply, which in the bulk would imply that we slice open across the splitting surface and glue the homology surfaces of the bra and the ket together. Okay, so this would compute for us in some at, at the kinematical level the matrix elements of the density matrix, and if you want to go ahead and compute replica observables, you would then be gluing bra and ket geometries to each other cyclically. Okay. I want to highlight a couple of geometric domains in such replica computations, uh, which I will use. I, I, at least I, I, won't, I won't define them carefully, but I'll at least tell you what they are. Um, and we will, I'll just mention them as we go along. So first we have the splitting surface, which is bulk co-dimension two. And it's the bulk extension, if you will, of the entangling surface. In addition, um, I'm defining something called the homology wedge, which is the past domain of dependence of the homology region. Um, and in some, in some sense, it's the analog of the entanglement wedge for these Rennie type geometries. But remember now that there's one copy of that in each of these bras and kets respectively. So if you're trying to compute a spectral uh, moment of a reduced density matrix, we have N bras, N kets, and various gluings going on. And each bra and ket has its had a copy of the homology wedge for the region and for the complement. Good. So once we have this, we can ask, what do we do? And how does we set up the gravitational uh, path in the, uh, radiational problem? And how does one evaluate the onshell action for such uh, configurations. So the, the gravitational path integral we want to take to be e to the is, but s is just let's let's uh, uh, take for simplicity focus on the case where we're just talking about Einstein gravity. So s is just the Einstein Hilbert action with Gibbons Hawking terms at the boundary of our space time where, where the boundary conditions are given. And that boundary replica manifold I'm here calling dn. We have a positive contribution to the action from the kets, a negative contribution to the action from the brass, and potentially co contribution from the splitting surface, which we have to understand separately. If we have, if we can compute these partition functions with given boundary, asymptotic boundary conditions, then we can compute the Rainy entropies by the standard formula. And I've just defined IN to be the onshell action of the gravitational solution on the spacetime MN whose boundary is the replica boundary geometry BN for say computing the nth Rennie entropy. The claim uh, I'll make and I'll try to justify, though I won't go through the details of the proof in the short time we have, is that first, the ge these geometries that we will obtain are complex, they won't be real. They need to be complex for reasons that you'll see in a second. And secondly, the physical answer for the Rennie entropies comes from the imaginary part of the action. The real part of the action tends to cancel out with NCPT symmetric configuration between the bra pieces and the ket pieces. So, the, so while generically real-time functional integrals compute amplitudes, here you get, um, and, and they give you phases, here you get something which is real, because of the fact that the, the solution itself is complex. In some sense, this is not surprising. This is real, something like trying to do quantum mechanics for tunneling, 
and try to extract some tunneling amplitude from uh, the, the stationary phase approximation, but it's sort of a, a gravitational generalization of that kind of state. So let's let's talk about the variational problem and let's talk about the variational problem in two steps. First, let's talk about the variational problems in the homology bridges away from the splitting surface. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll sort of forget about this S gamma for a second and ask what's happening. Now, if you just compute the variation of the Einstein Hilbert action, you get some momentum density and, and the variation, and which is basically proportional to the uh, extended curvature. And if you look at this, what, what stationarity of the action implies, it implies that the matrix and extrinsic curvature must be smooth across the gluing surfaces, across, across the homology wedges for being able to glue the bras and kets onto each other. So we are, we are gluing the, uh, the, the pieces differently across A and A complement, but the statement pertains independently of that uh, particularity of the glue. Moreover, you can use uh, replica and CPT symmetries to argue that the matrix must remain real inside the homology wedges. Okay. So that's why I wanted to emphasize this notion of the homology wedge for you before, that within the pass domain of dependence and in, of, of the, of the uh, homology surface, the metric must remain purely real. And in some sense, the variational problem there is no different from the standard variational problem. So all the action, if you, if you like, is happening at and around the splitting surface. And so let's just focus on that and let's focus on it by zooming on to it. And to make our life simple, we'll try to excise a tubular region around this splitting surface. So I've, I've tried to draw here, sketch here, um, a, a, a slice where I have sort of imagined a, a, a co-dimension to splitting surface coming out of this um, slide. And I have cut out uh, a, a disk uh, a disk shape region around it. Since the action is pretty much in co-dimension two, and the normal plane to this co-dimension two is, is has Lorentz uh, uh, signature, we could actually try to argue that the physics that we care about is pretty much confined to the two-dimensional normal plane with the transverse direction along the with, with the longitudinal directions along the splitting surface going for the right. Okay, this is a this has been exploited before in, in, in a very interesting paper by Luke and Sorkin from 25 years ago. And uh, what that allows us to do is to, uh, it allows us to use a, a suitable complex version of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem to extract what's happening at a, and around the splitting surface. Okay, so I've drawn here um, uh, a snapshot, um, a vertical cut through this plane to show the uh, um, uh, a particular slice of the splitting surface and some regulator that I've cut, used to cut out the tubular neighborhood around it. Okay. Before I say something further, um, let me say a, a heuristic, which I find useful. Uh, this has been said in, by many people in the past. Imagine you're trying to compute the onshell action for black holes a la Gibbons Hawking, but in real time in, the, in, in, in Lorentzian signature. So you have the Lorentzian black hole um, solution. And for a second, let me even pretend that I, I, can, I can sort of do the following. The Euclidean black hole solution has a topology of a cigar, but it's a, it's a cigar where the, the, the transfer sphere is non-trivially fibered over the radial direction. Let, let me, for the sake of illustration, just ignore this vibration and pretend that I have a direct product for disk times a sphere. Then the answer for the Gibbons Hawking entropy basically gets a factor of four pi from the Euler character of the disk. This is the second term. And it gets a contribution of area from the sphere. And you, you get this answer uh, directly on the nose. The details of how this works out, if you actually try to compute the Einstein-Hilbert action are more complicated, but this, this heuristic is useful to realize that the, the, when you go to the Lorentz signature, this piece has to become suitably complex in order to reproduce the answer. So if you go back to my previous statement and see where you got a real act value of the onshell action in Lorentz signature, it's coming from the fact that you're going to get imaginary contributions to this area from proportional to this area. So 
to understand what's going on at the um, splitting surface, we'll just use a trick that was um, nicely explained in a paper last year by Ji and Don, who argue that the, it's a useful way to think about the problem is to think of independent dials for the replica index and and the strength of the cosmic singular, conical singularity. Typically, when we are trying to think of, uh, the, say, for example, in the Euclidean way of thinking in the lefkowitz van der Sena way of thinking about uh, uh, the, the variational problem, one would have the conical singularity strength tuned to the size of the Rennie index. But uh, we can sort of decouple them and think, and basically this way, take one equation of motion out and treat that separately. Let me introduce a notation for the, uh, the action of gravity excising the cost of this uh, splitting surface. And uh, we, one can immediately use the arguments that these folks gave to show that the variation of this piece of the action with respect to the strength of the conical singularity is proportional to the area. And this I now comes from the piece of from the, from the analytic continuation from Euclidean to Lorentz signature. We can also use that analysis to inform ourselves as to what is the local geometry in the neighborhood of the splitting surface. So their analysis was Euclidean, but the local geometry basically can be obtained by, by going taking that Euclidean solution and asking what's happening if you analytically continue to um, uh, Minkowski signature, so that the normal bundle has uh, Lorentz signature metric. And uh, doing that, one right gets this following answer. The details of this are not important. These, these functions um, are, are, are not interesting in, in themselves. But what I want you to take away is that there are various fractional powers that show up in this, in this, uh, in this near splitting surface expansion. And so this matrix needs careful definition in terms of how we do the analytic continuation. And that's essentially where all the physics lies. Okay. So, so two things to say. First is if you have a source of um, energy momentum localized on a space like co-dimension two locus in space time, in Euclidean signature, that's a localized source. In, look, in Lorentz signature, you have to worry that this localized source has an effect on its light cone. And indeed, if you look back at the metric in some detail, you will see that this matrix has, seems to have singularity on the past light cone of the splitting surface. Secondly, when you analytically continue from the space, from the Euclidean domain, which is space like to the splitting surface to the real time domain, you also have to worry that the fact that some of these coordinates that we're using, which are adapted to the space-like um, side of the, uh, which are adapted, the, the light cone coordinates adapted to the space-like domain, they are negative in the, in the, in the Milner region, the sort of past of this um, splitting surface. Both of these problems can be cured by an I-epsilon prescription. And the I-epsilon prescription basically wants to uh, take the light cone coordinate x minus, which is x minus t to x minus plus i epsilon, and the opposite thing for x plus. And once one uses this prescription, one can go back, use this um, uh, two-dimensional gauss bonnet theorem, and just compute the contribution from the splitting surface. How one does the bookkeeping depends on how one wants to do the computation. I'll show you one particular bookkeeping in a second um, in, when I do the calculation in, in ADS2. But Whichever way one does the bookkeeping, when the dust settles, the contribution of the splitting surface is proportional to its area and it's proportional to this parameter, this uh, uh, strength of the cosmic um, uh, strength of the singularity minus one. So what, what you see immediately once you've done this calculation is that the variational principle holds everywhere in the bulk and it holds at the splitting surface when m is one, which is exactly what we wanted. So we have well-defined boundary conditions with the, with the sort of local answers I showed you for the matrix. And secondly, the on-shell action because of, of the evaluation before does indeed lead to an imaginary piece 
which is exactly what we expected because the final physical answer for the rainy entropies are of course real. So let me give you, that, that was pretty abstract, so let me give you a simple uh, calculation. Uh, and I've tried to sort of elide over some of the technicalities here, but this is sort of captures the crux of what I need. So we'll just look at JT gravity, uh, which is topological gravity, and there's a dilaton piece, which I'm going to sort of elide over because it, it won't, it, we will solve the equations including the dilaton, but it won't enter into the computation. And if you're trying to come, what we're trying to compute is the nth rainy entropy in the thermophile double state. We're thinking of JT gravity as Euclidean radius two or two copies of, in, in Lorentz signature, two copies of uh, the, the, the thermophile double state with two boundaries. And uh, so if you write down the metric for ADS2 in the, in, the one, in the replicated language, you'll find that it's basically exactly what I wrote down before with various fractional powers in these light cone coordinates. And what I'm going to try to compute is the on-shell action of this, uh, this matrix. The dilaton piece won't contribute, so I'll, I'll ignore that. And uh, I'll compute that by computing, by excising uh, the, co the cosmic singular, this uh, splitting surface by picking a disc-shaped uh, cutoff around it. So you can do this calculation in two, many different ways, but here's one way of doing it. So one way of doing it is basically you excise this disk and then use the, evaluate the einstein hilbert plus Gibbons-Hawking term in terms of the uh, Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So you get the Euler character, which for, for the annulus is zero. Then you have to evaluate the contribution from the boundary at the cutoff. And there's potentially some corner terms depending on whether your surface is hitting this uh, time slice perpendicularly or not. Um, so claim, and I'll tell you in a second how this works out, that you can compute each of these pieces separately. They'll, they'll give you the right answer. But let me just show you how the uh, calculation works for the extrinsic curvature. So pick some regulating function u of x, uh, x plus equals u of x minus, and just compute the extrinsic curvature so there's a piece which is given by some, which depends on u is explicitly. And there's another piece just, de just depends on this uh, uh, metric function sigma. And that piece is symmetric in x plus and x minus. So I, I, I'll just focus on one of them. So in fact, you'll see that they'll both have an imaginary piece and the imaginary pieces will add up where the real parts will, will not, will cancel between the bras and the kids. And the imaginary piece you can compute by just looking at the fact that this this, this integral has a one, one over x minus pole, and you use the principal value prescription to pick out the residue of the pole, and lo and behold, you get the answer that I advertise. Okay, so indeed, the rainy entropy, this is a thermophile double state. Um, the entropy here is independent of temperature, so you get exactly what you're supposed to get. So I'm, I'm using this as a exemplar of the general principle, but uh, we've been trying to compute this, use this technique to compute um, uh, rainy entropies in 2D CFT. Uh, uh, we have some success there already, and hopefully we'll sort of sort some of the, the cross, dot the remaining I's and the, cross the remaining T's and put out the paper in the not too distant future. Okay, so that was what I had to say about the, the replica trick and computing observables like rainy entropies. I want to talk a little bit about uh, using gravity to understand open quantum field theories, because I'll show you here, again, a use of a complex uh, geometry that does interesting, tells us interesting things about not just gravity, but also about strongly coupled systems which have long-term memory. So th the paradigm I wanted to keep in mind is one where I have some system which, which could be, which is basically a readout device for me, and have an environment which is thermal uh, and has some environmental degrees of freedom mixer. So I'm coupling the system to the environment with some uh, coupling in the Lagrangian. And if I integrate out the environmental degrees of freedom, I should get an effective action for the system, which is um, in real time has sort of decoupled pieces from the kets and the brass, but also a mixing term between the kets and the bra pieces on the fact that I had entanglement with the environment. 
So in the famous uh, terminology pioneered by Feynman and Vernon, these are influence functionals and they are further constrained by the microscopic unitarity of the system environment coatings. What I want to do is, so people have tried studying this in various different ways over the years. And as far as I know, there's no systematic study, uh, systematic understanding of this paradigm for quantum field theories. There's a well-developed story for quantum mechanics that goes back to some, to some extent to Feynman Vernon and to the famous discussion of Caldera Leggett in the 80s. So, and we make our life simple because the thing we, we one, one lesson we've learned in the last 20, 20, 25 years is that holography is a great, great guidepost when, we, when, you're, when you're trying to understand such questions. So we take our environment to be a thermal environment, provide a, a, a thermal plasma of a holographic field theory. So I'll just imagine that this environment is something like a N equals four super Young Mills plasma. So Xi are N equals four degrees of freedom. Psi is some auxiliary scalar that I'm going to couple to my N equals four and use to understand what's going on. The coupling could be some, it could be, a, you could take a scalar psi and couple it to some single trace gauge invariant um, operator for of N equals four. Could be a, and that, that, that's something I'll talk about in a second. Or you could take this, take some, some other tensorial field and couple it to the conserved currents of the N equals four super Young Mills plasma. I'll mention both of these because they have slightly different physics and, and the latter is a lot more richer and interesting. So there's a, some, there's a lot, long history of trying to understand real-time physics in ADS-CFT, but I, I want to highlight this paper that, that came out two years ago by the MIT people who gave a very clean understanding of thinking about this finger keldish computations. I'll only compute singly time out of time ordered correlators with, this, uh, with their proposal. So it's a two-sheeted space-time where you glue the domains of outer communication of the black hole across the future horizon. So in fact, you can even forget about the bottoms, but I've drawn the bottom to illustrate to you in a picture that will take some time to understand. Um, I'm imagining I'm preparing the thermophile double state um, by, by the Euclidean path integral, but rather than cut it the way the thermophile double instructs me to cut it uh, antipodally across the thermal circle, I'm going to cut it at t equals plus minus epsilon and then evolve forward and backward and glue back. So, um, so that's the distinction from the thermophile double construction because this, this way you actually have a path integral contour that starts out at t equals zero, goes forward, comes back at t equals minus epsilon and then goes back and then finishes off its Euclidean evolution by an amount beta. And what, what we showed um, in, in a paper from the spring is that you can actually compute real-time finger keldish correlation functions by just doing Witten diagrams on this gravitational scale geometry. Now, to me, this was important because for, for, what, for quite a while, it wasn't clear how, how does one compute real-time correlators in uh, using Witten diagrams in, in black hole phase times. Do we need to supply a boundary conditions near the singularity, et cetera, et cetera. These are questions that various people worried about in the past. But this, this prescription sort of very beautifully elides over those issues and sort of focuses on the essential part, which is what's happening at and around the horizon. It's a bit like what we just said, or things really matter what happens at and around the um, splitting surface. There's a matrix which, whose details I won't need, need for what I'm going to say. And all I'll say is that in the last uh, year and a half or so, Various groups, primarily uh, Logan Eigerman and his uh, collaborators, and have been trying to use this to study various physical problems. I want to ask, tell you something about one particular aspect of this, which is what happens when you take a probe that couples to conserved currents which have long-lived excitations, because they're almost Goldstone-like, coming from the fact that conserved currents are conserved. So. Just to remind people, the, if you try to excite black holes in general, the excitations die down on a time scale that's commensurate with the horizon size or inverse temperature. And this is due to the fact that most black holes have very short lived quasi normal modes. Famously, anti deciter black holes, planar anti deciter black holes, do not always have short-lived quasi-normal modes. They have very long-lived quasi-normal modes. Um, 
symptomatic, as Pauli Kastrosan and Tarinet pointed out a long time ago, of hydrodynamic behavior. Now, if you couple your probe to such hydrodynamic modes, you expect those modes to retain long-term memory of the black hole. And you should see that the effective action that you get for these modes is non-local. The question you want to ask is, how do you treat such effective field theories of probes coupled to hydrodynamic degrees of freedom? And it turns out the right way to parameterize them is to parameterize the problem and uh, in terms of the hydrodynamic moduli, which are the low-lying degrees of freedom that have that correspond to such long-lived quasi-normal modes, and compute a Wilsonian influence space, not a schwinger keldish influence space, which is basically something that is directly computing, uh, uh, if you like, um, the generative function of correlators. The correlators are non-local. And very surprisingly, you can say what we what what what, this, what happens here from a very simple toy model that exemplifies the physics of diffusion completely. And the simple toy model is this: just consider a scalar field coupled to gravity in say the short in the planar Schwarzschild areas black hole background with a coupling that is that is dialed by an auxiliary dilaton. This auxiliary dilaton is parameterized by a single parameter m, and the physics is m, the zero point of m is chosen so that if m is d minus uh, one, then we get uh, a minimally coupled scalar. And the physics of these probes is such that if m is bigger than minus one, all the quasi -norm its quasi normal modes decay fast. They are, it's a, it's a Markovian thing, that it retains no long term memory. But if m is less than minus one, this, these probes don't decay, they retain long-term memory. Importantly, the Hawking modes, the fluctuations associated with these quasi such, such probes uh, and their quasi-normal modes for non-Markovian probes are not, are not normalizable asymptotically in ADS. They grow at the U, in the asymptotic region. That in, in turn actually informs us that we should quantize them with non-standard Neumann boundary conditions and with a suitable modification of the boundary terms, you can actually directly on, on the nose land on this Wilsonian influence space. So I'm not giving you the details, but I want to emphasize that just thinking about how long lived memory effects manifest themselves from these kind of toy models in gravity, you're naturally led as usual to something that is natural in field theory. In some sense, again, another example of gravity teaching us how to do strongly coupled field theory. So I, I, I won't say any uh, much more than that, but to advertise that we can actually map the physics of conserved currents to such Markovian scalars. In particular, if you look at the shear or momentum diffusion mode for of n equals or super young mills, it just happens to have it's a non-Markovian scalar with index minus three, and you can use this framework that I've just outlined to compute the not just the retarded correlators of shear modes, which was computed famously in this paper, and see that you get the diffusion pole uh, with diffusion constant one over four pi t. You have a diffusion, uh, the diffusion pole is basically where this, where this function has a zero. And, but you also get, thanks to the schwinger keldys geometry, an explicit answer respecting Bose-Einstein statistics for the fluctuations. So this is the prediction of the retarded correlator. Uh, in this case of the Keldish correlator, in this case, you could have just used a two-point function. You could have just written it down by, by KMS relations. But I, I think that one, as, as we showed in our previous paper, uh, you get this for non-Gaussian fluctuations as well. Okay, I see that I'm slightly out of time, but let me just quickly uh, summarize by saying that I've tried showing you a general variational principle for analyzing real-time geometrics in gravity and showing you how to do direct computation from Lorentzian time-folded path integrals. And I've given you a, a, a glimpse of a framework for computing Hawking fluctuations associated with quasi-normal modes and uh, schwinger keldysh correlators and um, advertised for you that there is an effective description of non-Markovian dynamics of stochastic diffusion. Uh, and I'll stop there, thanks. Okay, well, thanks a lot.
Um, so uh, uh, we have time for questions. Anyone? Uh, I have a question. Daniel? Oh. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure, sure. Well, sure. Why don't you go ahead and then, uh, and then uh, uh, So I wanted to ask about the uh, about the the Witten diagram calculation that you mentioned. Uh, so this, uh, these are, I guess I didn't fully understand. So what is the bulk geometry? Uh, are we calculating? Yeah, what the boundary is the horizon? No, the boundary is not the horizon. The bulk geometry is uh, the following. You have two copies of the future half of the black hole and they're glued together smoothly on the across that future horizon. It's so the red line is the, the ADS. The red line is the ADS boundary, right? The red line is the ADS boundary. Yeah, operators are inserted on ADS boundary. Okay. And, and the boundary uh, correlate. And this, and so we are talking about inserting operators on only on one side. No, my operators are on both sides. They're at both uh, both legs of the schwinger kelvich contour. Okay. And the horizon is, is, can I see the horizon in this picture? Yeah, it's the edge. Uh, it's easier okay. if I explain I, the following. It, it, take the metric, take the Schwarzschild ADS metric. Yes. Okay. And analytically continue R to a complexified tortoise coordinate. Okay. Call it the mock tortoise coordinate zeta. And the zeta is double valued. There's a branch with zeta equals plus one and a branch with zeta equals zero. And the, you upgrade the geometric actions to a contour integral that encircle the horizon. Okay. Okay. And the, the non-trivial action comes from the discontinuities across this cut. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, great, uh, Daniel. Hi, Mukund. Um, I was just wondering more, this is about the first part of the talk. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there are these, so there was this paper by Xi and Itor about trying to derive the quantum extremal surface condition to all orders in perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. And I, I myself could never quite wrap my head around that. I mean, there are various confusing questions about what's the gauge in which you're varying the surface. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I'm curious if what's your current read on the situation in terms of what's the set of states where we've derived the quantum extremal surface condition to what order in perturbation theory have we derived it? Um, you know, presumably not assuming time reflection symmetry. So, so I, I think I'll, I'll make the following statement that I feel most comfortable with. Um, Xi has explained this to me many times, what, 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 how they think about it. And uh, so I, I, he can probably comment if he's around. I, I am very comfortable in saying that if you couple gravity as people have done to a large central charge matter theory where the central charge scales like one over G Newton, then in that regime, I'm happy making statement of the quantum extremal surface. And I don't think that that, that particular calculation, um, given what I just said in the first half of the talk, cares whether we are doing real time or Euclidean time calculations. Uh -huh. um, if you ask me what happens when you have a few quanta coupled to gravity, I'm less sure. Uh, you know, there's indications that you should be able to say this, but I'll, I'll defer this to other people who thought more deeply about this. 
But then you would say, I mean, because in, you know, in talking about replica wormholes, it's clear that at least in some sense, quantum mix, that you're, it's the bulk entropy term is important, right? Correct, correct. But, but, but let, 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 let's agree to some extent that, for example, in the East Coast discussion, it was important that uh, bulk entropy was the, the, the sort of the FLM term was comparable to the, to the entropy of the black hole. Yeah, is it really? I mean, so, so you say, like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm confused about whether that was important or not. It seems like it, in, on some level, it shouldn't have been important, but. Uh... Well, it's important because that's the regime where the quantum extremal surface jumps, right? Because for, for the quantum extremal surface to jump around page time, you, you want the entropy of radiation to be large. And that's, that's, that's the kind of regime that yeah, is easy to But describe. you could have that entropy be large, but with relatively small central charge. Yeah, that's right. That's large because of phi naught, right? Not because of C. I, I agree, Juan, but I'm, I'm just saying that the, the technicality of the computation, I, I feel most comfortable only making the statement. Yeah, I, I agree with what you say, but um, yeah. I think the idea is that when you have a small amount of, a small number of fields, but you accumulated a lot of entropy, and uh, then, then it, I suspect is valid. And it's probably the argument involves that the expectation value of the stress tensor should not have uh, big fluctuations in, in the various replicas. That that's a regime where it's valid. But like, so in, in your equations, Mukin, like on this slide, for example, you have D and D plus one. Uh, uh, are you imagining? So, so there, there, we don't, I don't quite know what C is, but there's some sense in which you want to say there are a lot of matter fields. I, I'm only talking about pure gravity here, just, just, just to be simple. But isn't that maximally bad? Isn't C equals zero then from, from that point of view? No, this is just like doing Lefkowitz model Sena. This is just completely the gravitational part of action. Oh, but but I thought I thought that in order to have uh, to talk about replica wormholes, you kind of that you need to be talking about the quantum extremal surface prescription. Maybe I missed something more basic. No, no. So I, I was giving you a clean way to think about ready computations from mm -hmm. just. But just with the lead, just with the leading term, not for, for now. Just to be the leading term. Yeah, I see. But if I wanted to have replica wormholes, then I would have to think about this other term, and then we would get into yeah. this discussion. So, so, so we could we could try to rewrite the whole thing here, adding the central the conformal field theory discussion, and ask you know what changes. I, I don't think anything does, but I I, don't, I also don't think that I, I haven't sat, sat down and dotted all my eyes and crossed all the t's to make a strong statement right now. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Uh, uh, Xiaoyang? Uh, hi, Mukun. Uh, I just have hi. a simple question. Um, so for the gravity single cavity calculation you shown in the black hole case, um, yeah. so for a more general geometry, is, I, I want, yeah, I haven't, I haven't said that this, uh, like you use something special for this geometry because you analytically continuate the uh, R variable, right? So, so you yes. complex divide some direction. So, it, so for a more general case, do we know in principle how to do the calculation? Um, uh, short answer, not quite, not yet. Um, oh. I have some, I mean, various of us have some ideas of how to do certain things. Uh, I, I would mean, really like love a, to in be principle, able to... I mean, like for example, like the Euclidean case, for general geometry, it will also be very complicated to calculate, to solve the geometry and study the RT surface. But in principle, we know what it means, I think. But here, um, yeah, like yeah, that. I, yeah, I, I, I can, I can say other things, but uh, 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 short answer is not, not quite, not, not yet. But I, I really would like to be able to do something like geometries where you can compute co correlators with, you know, in a quench setup where this. Time, actual time evolution and see how, how do you see if you like approach to equilibrium and so on and so forth. Not yet. Thanks. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, same things people wanted to discuss. Okay, I have a question. So you discussed that the geometry went all the way to the horizon, right? 
Now, in situations where you, let's say, instead of preparing the thermal, the thermal state, you prepare maybe a collapsing black hole or something like that, um, we expect that the, really, we expect to be able to see behind the horizon, right? Yeah. Um, so in, for some questions, it seems that the, the geometry will go behind the horizon, and perhaps for some other questions, it won't. Is it possible to see in this uh, discussion uh, when that is the case? Yeah. I, I'll, say, I'll make two comments, Juan. One is that, first of all, I, I'm doing something more than necessary in the bulk, because I'm, I'm following the boundary all the way to future time, t equals infinity, assuming that I'm not inserting sources. Right. I, I shouldn't have to do that in the first place, mm -hmm. from, from, from what I said at the very beginning. Right. Right. Okay, I, I would like to avoid that, but so in that sense, I shouldn't even have to go all the way to the horizon, except at the initial time in this geometry as well. Don't yet know how to do that. First, second, you're right that in some you can also extend it past the horizon, and and uh, and uh, and ask you know do it on some other surface. In fact, Don pointed to me something very important that in the bulk you could imagine putting um, forward backward evolutions uh, at will, which cancel out in the path integral. Right. So in some sense, gravity must. If you do, if you try to think of swing the collision gravity, this kind of spontaneous forward backward fluctuation should be there. They shouldn't contribute. I, I technically don't know how to see that, just as I don't know how to see the answer to your question just yet. Well, I mean, if you're doing classical evolution, it's obvious why they cancel. But uh, I, I agree. But I would like to sort of say that you know, when I when I run fields around them, somehow okay. things cancel out. But it would be nice to write down a geometry, see what the con constraints are, and do it. Heuristically, I agree with you. Okay. Um, anything else? All right. Well, if not, I mean, we can thank uh, thank Mukund again. And, uh, thank you. Yeah.